The room is getting silent. I can hear everybody's uh, anticipating. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we left the shades up because we wanted you to see the view. And now we're going to make it work for Tom's presentation. Um, we're really thrilled. This is the opening season of our visiting artist program in our new space. And we're just delighted to open this with Tom Finkelpearl, uh, the Commissioner of Culture for the City of New York. We can't tell you how excited we are about that. And also that all of you came tonight. And we hope you'll come back for many, many more presentations in this building. This is the new Columbia campus. This is the second building constructed right next to us is uh, the Mind Brain Behavior uh, Jerome L. Green Institute with a thousand neuroscientists. Uh, but the gateway to the entire new campus, no gates, by the way, I said gateway, but there are no gates, you may notice, for the new campus of Columbia. It's open to the public, but the gateway to the new campus is, is the School of the Arts and the Arts. And that's an enormous achievement for the whole uh, thinking about art in a major research institution. And we're hoping that we will be a really great contributor to um, Columbia University, to the city of New York, and to all of our neighbors and all of our fellow cultural workers in Harlem and beyond. So we're, we're glad to see you all here tonight and to welcome Tom. So I want to first, very briefly, I want to thank uh, Gavin Browning, who's there, who is our director of public programs, who works really hard and has put together this beautiful brochure. Some of you already have it, but if not, pick one up downstairs. This is our programming for the fall. The red side is everything that we've generated in the uh, public programs office, but on the other side are all the programs that have been generated by e individual programs in writing and visual art and theater and film. And there's going to be the theater showcases are going to be in the flexible performance space. There's going to be film screenings in the uh, screening room uh, downstairs. So there are going to be many, many School of the Arts programs that are going to happen in this building, but there are also going to be programs from people from throughout the world taking up really a complex social and cultural issues. So we want the building to really have that kind of liveliness um, and to really, really show that the arts are central to the conversations about the world at this time and how timely and important the arts are to the issues of social change, especially at such a complicated moment as the one we're living, not just in this country, but everywhere in the world right now. Um, so we have a lot of partners on tonight's event, and we love to partner. So if you're here from a cultural organization, we love to do things together, uh, both within Columbia, but also with everyone in the city. So we have, we're co-presented tonight by the Arts Administration Program at Teachers College, by Mailman School of Public Health, by Columbia GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Pre Planning and Preservation, and the Urban Social Policy Concentration particularly, and the School of International and Public Affairs, of course, because we also have with us tonight Esther Fuchs, who's going to introduce Tom Finkelpearl, and it's really um, my honor to get to introduce Esther so she can introduce Tom to you. But uh, Esther is so interesting that I love reading this bio, I have to say. So Esther Fuchs, Professor of International and Public Affairs and Political Science and Director of the Urban and Social Policy Program at Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She previously chaired Urban Studies for Barnard and Columbia Colleges. She serves as director of whosontheballot.org. You probably got emails from whosontheballot.org this week. Very important, an online voter engagement initiative. She's an executive committee member of Columbia Data Science Institute, a member of the advisory committee of its Smart City Center. She received the Bella Abzug Leadership Award in 2017. That to me would be like the award of my lifetime if I got that award. I would love getting that award. The B Above and Beyond Exceptional New York Women of 2017 Award for Education, the NASPA Public Service Matters Spotlight Award, the Who's on the Ballot for whosontheballot.org, an award for outstanding teaching at SEPA, which also would be very dear to my heart if I won that award. Uh, and the Distinguished Alumna Award from Queens College uh, also would be important, and many others. She served as special advisor to the mayor for governance and strategic planning under New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg from 2001 to 2005. And she's the author of so many articles and so many journal uh, and opinion pieces, I'm not going to read them all, but her major research includes a book called Mayors and Money, Physical Policy in New, Physical Policy in New York and Chicago, and it's the University of Chicago Press, and an important study, Shopping Trash, Where It Starts, 
mitigating floatable trash in New York City waterways, which she prepared for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. She consults for governments, for NGOs, and business. As a frequent political commentator in print and broadcast and new media, she received a BA from Queens College, CUNY, an MA from Boston Brown University, and a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. She's a great colleague and a great friend, so Esther Fuchs. Thank you, I'm embarrassed by that introduction. I think only my mother would say nicer things about me than you did, Carol. And um, we all have to thank Carol for this amazing space. I'm just really thrilled to be here tonight at the inaugural event. She is the brains behind this. She was the advocate. She convinced the president it should be done. And here it is. So it's really my pleasure, and I'm really delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Commissioner Tom Finkel-Pearl of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, as Carol said, we can't really think of more appropriate person than Tom Finkel-Pearl to inaugurate Columbia School of the Arts' spectacular new building. Um, but some of you actually may be wondering why Carol asked me to introduce the commissioner. Now, you know, I am passionate about the arts. I do attend New York City theater a lot, even if it might bankrupt me sometimes. And um, that's important, of course. But I don't think that I was brought to the podium this evening um, because of my passion for the arts. But I do know a few things about Tom and the important position he has as Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. And I can share with you a few things that I think all of you should know. First of all, I can tell you that the Department of Cultural Affairs is actually one of the smallest city agencies in city government and has a budget that is so small that the budget director, when I was in government, used to call it, oh, that's just a rounding error in the city's overall expenditures. So think about how you create the kind of impact that Tom, that Tom creates with one of, in one of the smallest agencies with one of the smallest budgets. So I also know that among government agencies, only the federal government spends more on culture than New York City. And I also know that culture is one of the most important engines of New York City's economic resurgence. For those of you who weren't here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you know, go see the movie Death Wish. Okay, it was pretty accurate, too. And now what we have are cities around the world trying to duplicate New York City's success and the important role that government plays in ensuring the vitality of arts and culture in the city. So that's all interesting, I know, but now you're probably thinking, what does Tom do as New York City Cultural Affairs Commissioner? And how has his leadership transformed cultural policy in New York? Because it has. First of all, Tom oversees city funding for nonprofit organizations across all five boroughs, which is what I want to emphasize. And for some of you, this may be a surprise that there are incredible cultural institutions outside of Manhattan, including the Queens Museum, where Tom was executive director for 12 years. And uh, in truth, I am a Queens girl, having grown up in Bayside. And I can tell you that Tom's work in Queens was transformational for the borough. He not only doubled the size of the space of the museum, but created collaborations with diverse neighborhoods all over Queens. And anyone here who has not taken the number seven train to Queens, well, you know, you should be buying a Metro card and getting on that train right away because Queens is the most diverse borough in the city. And it will explain to you a little bit about how important Tom's work was, and still is. And, if you, and 
The other thing you should do is go to the Queens Museum and to PS1 Contemporary Art Center where another cultural institution where Tom left his strong imprint. Now one of Tom's strengths is that he brought that commitment to all of New York City's communities to his work at City Hall and this is extremely significant because New York City, for better or for worse, has and always probably will be Manhattan-centric, although Brooklyn's given it a run for its money, not Queens, Brooklyn. But we are a city of five boroughs, and we are a city that requires attention to be paid to all of these neighborhoods. And you can find this in Tom's enlightened approach to funding of cultural institutions in New York City and to New York City's first cultural plan for all New Yorkers. I read this report, I was just blown away. It's so important he spearheaded this report. It is a blueprint as much as a report. And as a public policy professor, I just value this idea that it's not a report to put in a closet. It's a blueprint on how to get it done. And I know he'll be uh, talking about this with Carol tonight, but I just want to point out that this plan calls for increased funding of community arts and cultural institutions and also reducing the costs of cultural events for low-income New Yorkers. It is a plan that takes the word equity seriously and um, shows us the way of how, how to get there. Tom's leadership on these issues should not have been surprising. He also served as the director of the Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art program, and his most recent book, What We Made, Conversations on Art and Social Cooperation, could have probably gotten him tenure in the School of the Arts, is my guess right now. He examines the activist participatory uh, as co-authored aesthetic experiences being created by contemporary art. Now, I don't really know what that is, but it sounded very good to me. Um, and something that the Academy would certainly appreciate. I should also mention he received his BA from Princeton University, we'll say that quietly, and an MFA from Hunter College. Okay, enough said. It's my pleasure to welcome Commissioner Finkelpearl to Columbia. Yeah, I sometimes say that under Bloomberg, I might have said I was a Princeton graduate. Under de Blasio, I'm a Hunter College guy, right? Just like you're a Queens College girl, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so thanks a lot, and you know, thanks everybody for coming. This is a fantastic place. I've been to this building before. You know, wow, Carol, congratulations. So what I want to do actually is uh, talk about what we do at Cultural Affairs. I can talk a little bit about Queens first, and then talk about the cultural plan. Then we're going to sit down and chat for a minute and get some questions. So I um, was director. You know, I was at PS1 Contemporary. Have be, people been to PS1 Contemporary Art Center? Yeah, yeah. How about Queens Museum? Oh, wow. That was good. I, okay, thank you. That was almost as many as the... Uh, okay. So the Queens Museum is in the middle of Flushing Meadows Corona Park. It is in the middle of one of the most culturally diverse places in the world. It was the home of the United Nations General Assembly in the 40s. It was a, it was a um, 1939 World's Fair building. So it has this incredible uh, legacy of internationalism. And then you just walk right outside the door and you're in this place, um, which is the most culturally diverse place in America, arguably one of the most culturally diverse places in the world. So we did, we worked hard for, I was there for 12 years, we did a big renovation. This is showing the museum after the renovation, uh, which really used that big central space to create this kind of agora in the middle of the building. The idea of, you know, to create this kind of open public space. By the time I left the Queens Museum, we had decided that our mission statement could be boiled down. Is that, yeah, is that because I'm walking around? That our mission statement could be boiled down to one word, and the one word was openness. The idea that we were sort of open in a lot of different ways. We had a very diverse staff. Uh, we had programs for uh, people with disabilities. We had multilingual classes, partnerships with the library system. The library systems in New York are the open democratic public institutions that cultural institutions aspire to be at some level. 
it's like the public school system, CUNY, and the library systems are, are in my way, in my mind, some of the you know, great cultural uh, uh, organizations in the world. So this is just a little demographic map, in case you don't know. Queens is about as diverse as it gets, and you can see how much it's more diverse than the other boroughs. But then, if you look at the way that we sort of uh, talk about what a race and identity in the United States, um, Within the Asian community, it's extremely diverse. Within the Latino or Latinx community, it still says Hispanic, by the way, on this uh, very retarded terror chart. Um, but there's, so within our community, on one side of the Flushing Meadows Corona Park was a very diverse group of Chinese people, including a lot of Taiwanese. Um, there are people from different parts of mainland China, lots of Koreans. There's a big South Asian population, uh, mostly Indian on that side of the park. And then you go on the other side of the park and it's almost 90% uh, Spanish speaking, but very diverse between you know, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian, Mexican, Dominican, Colombian, Peruvian. So this was, you know, when you say that we had this very multicultural staff, when I got to the Queens Museum, there was not a single person on the upstairs staff, meaning aside from maintenance and security, who spoke Spanish as their first language. By the time I left, we had multiple different uh, folks from different parts of uh, Latin America, different, giving different perspectives, different backgrounds, different um, ideas of uh, what connection to the community could be. We had people who spoke three different Chinese languages, which was actually four Mandarin, Cantonese, Shanghai dialect, and Hakka. I was talking to a friend of mine from uh, Flushing, he said, yeah, Hakka is a very, very small language. Only about 50 million people speak it. So there's actually a lot of Hakka speaking people in Flushing. Um, so I just wanted to so we're in this place in the world. The Queens Museum actually had a long legacy of doing very multicultural programming, but didn't really have a very multicultural staff. So you had this situation where you do the Korean show, and, and a lot of folks from the Korean community would show up. You do a Mexican show, a lot of people from the Mexican community would show up, but you didn't have continuity. And that's when I really began to believe that the staff and the board, uh, the diversity of that group of people had to be reflective of the folks you want to be communicating with. So that uh, was you know, this major project. So we did do things like, and this is a show uh, from Mexico City called ABCDFA, which was about Mexico City, really interesting photography. Um, and uh, painting, et cetera, show. There's a big Tibetan community in Jackson Heights. I think it's the biggest Tibetan community in the United States. Um, we did a show of contemporary Tibetan art. Some of the art came in straight out on, you know, uh, sort of bootlegged DVDs. But the other thing we did a lot of was to get outside the doors of the museum. Um, we had an event, a uh, young Ecuadorian artist said, you know, there's this big Ecuadorian community in, in uh, Corona, and there's Ecuadorian Day. There's all these national days that occur in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. So she said, on Ecuadorian Day, we're going to do an event, we're going to do it at this place, Corona Plaza, and all the Ecuadorian folks, and which is like 50,000 people show up for that event, are going to be streaming up. Roosevelt Avenue, and we're going to, so what she did was, she worked with a bunch of guys who had these mundasas, the, the moving trucks, uh, and they um, worked with her, and the moving trucks were the site of this art project, and inside the trucks were projected these films, and the films were, there's a lot of folks at that point uh, in time who would communicate back and forth to their family in Ecuador via these videos, which were actually physically brought back and forth, not sent on the internet. So these would be things like, you know, a kid saying, you know, I miss you, my father, you know, who's gone off to work in Queens. And these really heart-rending, you know, um, just homemade videos about loss and memory. And then she projected on the outside of the trucks images of, um, of Ecuador of, you know, just walk going along the uh, highway. And, and so it was this incredible moment. And the guides to the exhibition were the Ecuadorian truck drivers, who in Spanish were talking to the Ecuadorian folks walking up the street. And we said, oh my god, this is an incredible place to do art programming. It's 103rd and Roosevelt Avenue in Corona Plaza. 
So we started to work there off-site extensively, and later on, uh, this is, was adopted as a, a plaza that we got redesigned uh, by the city. Uh, and this is a little festival there at Corona Plaza. By the way, can we lower the lights a little bit? Because there's the slides, yeah, if possible, if not. So right here you have something called Uni, which is a sort of portable library, uh, which was an incredible public art project to get set up. It was a very hot day that folks who did uni actually just walked right down the street and got these little parasols so that people could sit there and read to their kids, etc. Here, there's, a, there's actually a, a large um, uh, non-Spanish speaking Latin American community not far from uh, in Corona, etc. So these are Quechua speaking folks who are doing their some native um, whatever uh, Andean dance, um, and they, they were folks that we worked with quite a bit. And then in the back were these uh, tents set up, which had so, kind of social services, so immigration advice, you know, advice on how to get uh, affordable health care, et cetera. So it was a combination. Arts was a way to draw a crowd, to engage a crowd, and then there was a kind of a social aspect um, sort of layered on top of the arts. So this was something we began to do quite a bit of. We started uh, working with an artist named Tanya Bergera, who I think has lectured here. I think she might be coming back. She started something called Immigrant Movement, which was a collaborative project, which is essentially um, a storefront where uh, a ton of activity happened. And essentially, it was like a, a free workshop. So there would be a workshop about uh, dance or poetry. It took place almost entirely in Spanish. It's still going. It's now, I think, five or six years later. And here are just a couple of examples. This is a group of Dream Act kids. Obviously, this is right in the paper today. These are dreamers who are there uh, doing a kind of community uh, education project, uh, collaborative. One of the things about Tanya is she often wasn't around because she's so busy and is off, you know, which actually allowed folks in the community to kind of take the place over. And there's a group uh, started by a woman named Veronica Ramirez, who you know quite well, who started something called Mujeres en Movimiento. I don't speak Spanish, so please uh, excuse my. Uh, but it's, a, it's immigrant movement, but the name Women in Movement was sort of the women in the movement, meaning in within this immigrant movement. And they started, it started almost like a dance class, but it became a dance class, which is also about, you know, self actualization and power. It became later a bicycle-oriented uh, um, group. They got bike paths put in against the community board's wishes, overruled by the mayor of New York City. It was one of the great moments of my adult life. I was out at a community meeting in um, Queens, and uh, Veronica Ramirez asked the mayor of New York in Spanish, what are you going to do about those bike paths on 108th Street? And the mayor said, we're putting them in. It was an incredible moment of, uh, and also grew out somehow of this uh, project, immigrant movement. So this, this is a group of Dream Act kids. This is a moment when, um, this is Tanya Breguer here. This is our city councilwoman, Jillis Ferris. This is me. I don't like the way my stomach is sticking out here. But this is uh, Rick Lowe, the famous you know, MacArthur winning, amazing uh, artist who's founded Project Row Houses. People had come around from the entire country to talk about the idea of arte utile, which is useful art. Art that can be used as a tool. In a community context, in Queens, I remember I was speaking at the Creative Time Summit a couple of years ago, and people were saying, oh, how did you do all this stuff? And I said, I had this incredible uh, advantage. And the advantage was, this amazing vehicle of cultural transformation. It's called the seven train. And you could all get on it. There's no barrier to you getting on the seven train, going out to Corona and hanging out at immigrant movement. It's open, everything is free. You might, you know, either speak Spanish or bring a Spanish speaking friend to help. So this is a day we went down to Occupy Wall Street with a bunch of people from Creative Time. Okay, so this is what I'm, at. I'm doing, sort of uh, creative artwork. Um, there at the Queens Museum was a big collaboration with the library system in Queens where we were teaching classes in native tongue. The first four classes would take place at the community library, let's say in Spanish or in Mandarin or in Korean. The second four classes would come to the museum. 
It was a way of meeting people on their own terms, in their own language, in their own community, as an introduction to the museum, rather than simply saying, we're going to open the doors and hope people walk in. This idea of having an explicit moment of introduction and um, invitation. OK, so then, after much hemming and hawing, I was somehow appointed Commissioner of Cultural Affairs uh, of New York City. And, so, and this is actually something that you were just saying, sir. What is it that we do? Um, we're the landlord for 33 cultural institutions, including natural history, the Met. Um, it's a deal that goes back to the 19th century uh, with the foundation of natural history in the Metropolitan Museum, PS1 Contemporary Arts Center. Anybody been to warm up? Come on, I can't believe it. Um, we have zoos and gardens. This is uh, the uh, aquarium in Coney Island. This is the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. So we are after the federal government. So when you say we're a rounding error, it's still a lot of money. We are, around, we are so we have uh, this year $180 million of operating money and about another $170 million of expense, of uh, uh, capital. So $320 million this year. And, but by the way, so I was sitting with the guy who runs the art program for the Department of Education. They spent $400 million on art out of a $23 billion budget, the Department of Education. I don't think there's any other city in America that has a budget as big as our Department of Education. Do you think that's true? 100% true, yeah. So we're big, it's a big city. We should have the biggest cultural budget. We also have the biggest cultural budget per capita with the possible exception of San Francisco. Um, so in this position as Cultural Affairs Commissioner, I'm sort of still, my heart is in Queens somehow, and I'm thinking about the rest of the city and how is cultural um, funding distributed. And by the way, I have to also just say quite clearly, I do love these big Manhattan cultural institutions. And when I was asked, uh, the first day that, you know, where de Blasio was there, and somebody from NPR walked up and said, what do you want to do? And I said, I love the big ones, I love the Met, I love the things happening in Manhattan. But I said, you know there's a lot of Sri Lankans in Staten Island. I'll bet you they have a dance company and I'll bet you it's important to that community. So actually the first or second day I got to the Queens Museum, the Sri Lankan dance company from Staten Island called up and said, yes, we do exist and uh, you've got to come out. And actually I've met with them numerous times since then. It's the Sri Lankan Dance Academy. They were there, they've been there for 24 years and were just as established as a nonprofit last year. So they were existing as a vital part of their community without any government support um, or minimal government support, you know, based on, you know, selling uh, tickets to their performances and based on volunteerism and based on a Sri Lankan restaurant that one of the uh, owners ran in Manhattan. Um, anyway, so, I, so I, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that I don't also love the, the Manhattan organizations. Especially because I see one of the Manhattan Organization's directors sitting right up here. No, I'm kidding. And there's Lincoln Center over here. Um, and by the way, we're, we are uh, <laughs> the landlord of Lincoln Center Museum of the City of New York. There's one um, incredible uh, range of history institutions, science institutions, zoos, gardens, etc. Performing arts. Okay. So one of the first things that we did uh, was to do say, okay, let's take stock of the cultural diversity of the folks that work at these cultural institutions. So this is, this is information not gathered by us, but gathered by AAM, which says New York, or, uh, America, or the United States of America, is becoming increasingly diverse. You can see what it looked like 25 years ago, today, what it's gonna look like 25 years into the future. And then you look at who works at cultural institutions, isn't very diverse and isn't getting much more diverse. So, and by the way, I, I want to also say that one of the things that really came out of this diversity study is how incredibly inadequate all the information that we have about disability, which is extremely important uh, to us to, to consider. And also, um, it's just male-female, right? There's no uh, gender, no LGBTQ. Um, so I, I want to say that our statistics are pretty bad in those ways but pretty accurate when it comes to at least how we define race in this country. So, okay, so that's the national statistics, and then we said let's compare it to New York City. 
So that's the US population today is 34% people of color. New York City today is 65% people of color, but our workforce is only 37%. Now that's, as you can tell, way better than the national average if you look back at that last slide. But then, okay, so this is sort of how it breaks down. Um, that it, you know, it's a very white workforce, but beyond that, where are people of color working in these cultural institutions in New York City? This is New York City, this is our survey. So you can see that the whitest job in the, in the cultural sector is curators, the people who make the decisions about what goes on the walls. And the uh, least white job is security and maintenance. So, so it's not just a matter of, you know, let's say, who's working at institutions, it's what are people doing and who's making the decisions. So then there actually are some, you know, some bright points down here that there are certain things like finance, education department, programming that are more diverse, and that's good. But the other thing that, that is sort of both somehow disturbing and maybe not disturbing is that when you look at the, you know, who got hired in the last six or seven years is much more diverse. And that actually junior staffs are considerably more diverse than senior staff. So one of the questions in, when you talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion is not simply um, you know, who's working at the museum, but what's, what's, where are they in the cultural organization? How do you bring people up through steps to those more senior positions? So you understand what, how this works, that there's, you know, the junior staff is, um, is the most diverse, right? Um, but these are the uh, senior staff is, you know, very not diverse. And so that's part of that is hopefully that if we are doing that right, that we're going to continue to bring people through the pipeline up into those senior positions. So how does that work? And so there's one way that it works. Who's here from Studio Museum? Okay, this is your galleries, right? <laughs> right at the center of your galleries is right here, Selma Golden. And right over here are the director of the Whitney and the director of the Modern. So I just happened to take this picture afterwards. I said, oh my goodness, this is like, here's Thelma walking in the direction of Glenn Lowry and uh, Adam Weinberg. And so one of the things that Studio Museum has done is very consciously said, we're going to be an exporting, uh, we're going to be a training center for talent. So these people at the Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Los Angeles, or uh, Institute of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Whitney, the Modern, who are, who have come through the pipeline of the Studio Museum. So that's one of those pipelines that works, uh, that's intentionally, um, you know, creating this talent pipeline. So I, so I want to talk about a couple of other things that we've done, and then I'm going to talk about our diversity initiative. So we, um, anybody here have the ID card, municipal ID card? Ah, good. So a million New Yorkers have it. Have you guys gotten any free memberships to cultural organizations, I hope? Yes, good. So this was something, New York City has a lot of people that don't have ID cards. They might not have an ID card because they were formerly homeless. They might be undocumented. So a way to document the undocumented is to create a, a, a municipal ID card that doesn't rely on citizenship. So one of the ways to say we don't want that card to be simply here's the undocumented card is to say let's make it attractive to a lot of other New Yorkers. So here's the card. It was advertised in many different languages, but one of the great aspects of the card is with that card, and you can still do it, you should do it if you haven't done it yet, you can get free memberships to 40 cultural institutions. And so far, 500,000 free memberships have been given away. I remember my boss, who's first deputy mayor, said, this isn't a pilot. You know, this is what government can do. This is at the scale of government. A million people have the card, 500,000. Uh, not necessarily 500,000 people, but 500,000 memberships have been distributed free to New Yorkers uh, on the basis of that card. So that was one of the big successes. Um, we have a creative aging program, which uh, puts artists in senior centers. I'm going to flip through these rather quickly. We have been working on affordable real estate for artists. We understand the incredible pressure on artists uh, these days in New York City. So this is actually a second floor of a library in Williamsburg, which is now uh, run by uh, Spaceworks. Um, and that's a um, very low cost way to get people into studios, art studios, uh, performance spaces, et cetera. Um, we talked a minute ago, you went to Queens College, I got my degree at Hunter. CUNY 
sends eight times more people, propels eight times more people into the middle class every year than the entire Ivy League, plus Stanford, University of Chicago, Duke, and whatever, something else. Eight times as many. So when you think about what quality of a university, and my wife got a PhD here at Columbia. We love Columbia. I'm not, I don't want to say anything bad about Columbia. Um, <laughs> This is an incredible system in New York City. 250,000 undergraduates, so 250,000 students, plus another half, a uh, quarter of a million of part-time students. People come out of these colleges. Did you have student debt when you graduated from Queens College? Zero, right. It took me four years to get through Hunter, but I came out, I was working, with zero debt. Zero tuition, yeah, okay. I was a little bit later, maybe. <laughs> By the way, it, one of the, when we, we'll talk about the cultural plan in a minute. We did a uh, session about aging in the arts, and this fantastic woman who came, who wrote a book called um, This Chair Rocks about ageism, and I'm just not going to apologize for the fact that I'm 61 years old. And it's like, yeah, it's a fact. It's cool, no problem. So don't apologize for, good, excellent. <laughs> she wasn't. Um, that's my ageist, uh, you know, uh, prejudice. In any case, um, get back to CUNY. So we started something this year called CUNY Cultural Core last year, which is, look, one of the obstacles to inclusion is paid internships, and unpaid internships. So, you know, you, all these kids who can afford to just walk into a place and, and give their labor for free, I couldn't, I never did that. And my brother, I'm not, I'm not, I came from a very solidly middle class family. I don't want to you know, misrepresent, but I wasn't ever in the position to say, I'm going to come in there and work for free. I worked in factories in summers, and I, you know, I never did an internship. So I was lucky enough to get into the system. So these kids, we have um, 84 uh, CUNY kids, CUNY Cultural Corps, who are each year uh, interning, paid internships at cultural organizations. And that's going on. I think it's actually getting bigger this year. Um, did you have them at Museum of the City of New York? Yes, these are incredible kids, yes. And you're going to do it again, yes. We had a kid working at uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs who uh, was recently from uh, Bangladesh. He spoke four or five languages. He spoke Bengali, Hindi, Urdu, English, and one other random European language, which I can't remember. Incredible photographer. You know, this kid needed exposure, I felt, to the arts as a possible venue for his creative He's a great photographer. He's got, I don't know, 8,500 followers on Instagram. Um, this kid was, is going to business school, and I, I feel like it's a loss to the arts community if this kid doesn't end up in the arts. Now, he might also just make a lot of money and be happy the, the other way, but I think he should be a professional photographer. And I'm, I'm sure he's in this picture somewhere. I don't want to... He'll, he'll become a, yes, a trustee. Um, we have something called Turnaround Arts, which this was actually a beautiful moment at the beautiful White House when it was a beautiful place to be, with Michelle Obama having her hand around one of these kids. Uh, it's a, it was from the President's uh, Committee on the Arts, uh, and what it is is really deeply infusing the arts into a small number of, and this part I didn't like, they said some of the lowest performing schools in America. And that's just a terrible thing to say. They kept saying that. I was like, don't say that. Say these are schools with lots of potential that need, you know, need the arts. Anyway, the kids were fantastic. They went to the White House. They had a beautiful moment. We're doing that in three, three schools? Four schools in, in um, East New York and Brownsville. Um, we have a program called Building Community Capacity, which I won't go into great depth, but it has to do with going to communities and helping communities create coalitions. Um, so I just want to talk about a, a little bit more research we've done and then the cultural plan. We worked with a group from the University of Pennsylvania um, on a research uh, project about the social impact. When people often talk about the economic impact, arts are good for the economy, they're also good for communities. And what these folks from Penn demonstrated is that arts and culture are an integral part of a healthy community. I'm not going to go into too much depth about how they did that. But they looked at multiple um, aspects of well-being. So not just the economy, but things like high blood pressure and diabetes and educational attainment and safety. 
And it turns out that the um, communities that have a higher degree of arts participation and assets have are healthier communities. So this is an argument for saying, let's not just invest, and we'll continue to invest in the you know, fantastic tourist drawing institutions, but organizations and communities um, that bring arts to those uh, communities are doing something substantial and measurable as well. So that then led us to, you know, these are by the way, these are what's called civic clusters, and these are the um, uh, concentrated disadvantage. So the two different kinds of communities that this study pointed money towards, and one was uh, uh, communities, low-income communities that have a surprising concentration of arts and cultural activity. Uh, where additional investment would make it an even healthier community. And then these communities that, that are concentrated disadvantaged that have very little in the way of arts and culture and also very little in the way of uh, sort of economic activity. So these are, I think these are the concentrated disadvantaged communities. Um, okay, so I'm gonna now talk about Create NYC. 59 seconds. So. We just did a cultural plan for New York City. That was like the trailer uh, made by City Hall. Who made that? City Hall, yeah, okay. But this is Nadia Alokta, who worked full time on the cultural plan. If you really want to know what's going on, she was. We did how many public meetings? 418 public meetings. I might have been at 100. You were probably at 300 of them or something. Every, so we went out there and we talked to something like 30,000 in person New Yorkers. And he said, what do you want in terms of arts or culture in your community? What do you need? And we had focus groups. We had aging in the arts. We had you know, public art. We had uh, a couple of different focus groups about disability. Um, we did, went to different parts of the city. We did big, open. We went to Harlem Stage and did one of them at Pat Cruz's joint, uh, which was a really good one. Where, and and we, had, uh, we were working with a community sort of uh, planning group called Hester Street Collaborative where you break up into tables and then you come back together and report back. So, uh, and then there's another 150,000 people who weighed in online. So with all that information, we came up with a cultural plan. The cultural plan has 94 recommendations. And, you know, these are kind of, as you say, visionary. It's not like you, we will spend $800,000 over two years in this particular community. It's um, more general than that, but we also have a particular group of, um, of you know, goals that we're going to be sort of diving into quite quickly. Um, and one of those, what happened here? There we go. One of those, and sort of, well, you know what happens is the press actually makes it into one headline, yeah, which is, yeah, that's sort of, that's okay, but hold on, we're okay with it, because we participated in that as well. So we sat down with the mayor at a, press conference and we said, what we're going to forefront right now is the continuation of our diversity initiative. And we're going to say, so we have a thousand cultural organizations that we fund. We are big funders of those 33, but we also fund just about everybody else, except not universities, I'm sorry to say, somehow. Um, so we said what we're going to do right away, and this became one of the big headlines, is to say, First of all, all of our uh, applications starting this year are going to have questions about how your organization addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for those big ones, we're going to spend this year focusing on what is an effective way to have a, a diversity, and equity, and inclusion plan. And next year, we're going to require you to have the plan, all you big 33 institutions. And, uh, 
if you, you know, and that'll have financial consequences if you don't adopt it. So this is something where I have now been on the phone. We spoke already about this. This is a director of one of those cultural institutions. And this is something we really want to do collaboratively, that we want to do in a way that's good for the institution, that understands that Studio Museum has a different diversity, equity, and inclusion goal than Museum of the City of New York. It's just different institutions have different ways of looking at diversity. So that became the big headline. But there's a lot of other stuff in the plan. We've already activated lots of new money for artists, uh, grants to individual artists. We have uh, what I always say might be one of the most important aspects of the plan is our green initiative. We pay for energy, for heat and light, for those 33 institutions. Those 33 institutions use as much energy as CUNY. It's a big set of huge institutions. So tens of millions of dollars are being spent on energy every year. So we're going to hire, or we have a job out there if anybody's an engineer in this room, um, to analyze the energy needs and try to save money on energy. So it's like sort of nerdy stuff like that and sort of the headliney stuff like the diversity initiative. Anyway, I don't want to go too much, too much further, but um, this is in a way what became the headline of the entire plan. It is super important. We care a lot about it, but there's a lot of other stuff in the plan. Um, so, I mean, and then I think I'll wrap it up with that. But the main thing about the plan is to say, we understand the maps that we saw before about where culture is more represented in the city, where it's less represented in the city. And so people have asked me, you know, what would be a success of this cultural plan? So I said, you know, I mean, I think de Blasio is going to get reelected. I hope I'm reappointed as commissioner. If at the end of the next four years we fill in those maps, and those maps don't look as inequitable as they look now, that's a success. That's the overall success of the plan. All right. So what's that? I'm going to stop there, and then we're going to talk, right? OK. So we're going to talk for a minute up here. and then. Yeah, 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 speak in the mic. Oh, sorry. How are they? Okay. Use the mic, okay. Um, so we were going to use cards for questions, but we have such a great group, I think we'll just open it to questions after we're done talking. Um, so there's so much, I mean, there's so much I want to know, but I'm, I'm going to, oh, this is, I, okay, here we go. If I fall off, don't laugh, all right. Um, First, I, I just want to say, just to comment on something you just said, that you don't fund universities, but you fund uh, all our students after they leave who are in residencies, who are organizing small theaters around the city, who are organizing co collaborative collective spaces, who are have subsidized studios. I mean, so it's not direct, but absolutely we're very much involved um, in, in this plan, and, very, and now especially to thinking about our role in this building and the city and, and how we fit in. So, so I, I wanted to start with something personal because uh, we've known each other a long time since uh, Tom is director of Skowhegan, which is that fabulous residency, beautiful arts place in Maine in this idyllic situation where artists get to go and contemplate art and life and think. And, so, and, and there have been so many jobs um, between that and where you are now. And, and you were trained as an artist, you're a writer, Esther's right, you could have, those books could get you tenure here if you'd like to come anytime. Um, so you made a lot of choices along the way. And I, I think about this as very personal too, because people often ask me, well, why are you a dean? You know, why do that? You're a writer, you don't. And uh, I have a lot of thoughts about, you know, leadership and why you do certain things. But what I wanted to ask you is, at this stage, why government? And you know, how do you how do you think about that? And why are you doing it? I mean, this is not an easy place to be. Yes. And you know, as you say, you unveil this fantastic cultural plan with so many dimensions, and everybody gloms onto one thing, yeah. and you know, pushes on that button. Uh, so I ask you that. So. Yeah. So I mean, actually, I've got some of my colleagues over here, so you can. There's 
four younger people in the front row you could talk to um, if you want to know the answer to that. So actually, I'll give an example which I've given before, which is anybody spend much time in Rockaway? So I, I have a place in Rockaway, and so when Sandy hit, there was a Occupy Sandy, and a bunch of kind of hipster artists showed up, and it was really kind of amazing, and they had like bicycles, and they were sort of riding around and showing up on people's front porch and saying, can we help you dig out of your house? So, which was great, but it didn't solve the problem. What you needed was the Army Corps of Engineers to set pumps out a mile offshore and pump the sand back onto the beach. Nobody but government could solve that problem. Rebuilding the boardwalk, which is five and a half miles long, only government could do it. So the scale of government is where problems can get solved. So if you think about equity initiative, and you think about an equity initiative, look, we did that at the Queens Museum, and I'm very proud of what we did. We had a $5 million budget. We now have a $300 million. But we also influence the activity I mean, just the cultural institution group is half the cultural life of New York City in terms of attendance, right? So it's millions of people going. So I think, you know, people distrust government, and I understand why. I've been in government before, but I think you have to trust government. And if you want to, I don't know, I, feel, I really feel if you want to make substantial change, a really great place to be is government. And I think that you can get, you can move into jobs that have a tremendous amount of influence earlier in your life, in career, in government. Um, you know, it's not, it can be incredibly frustrating because of the levels of bureaucracy. But, you know, so I think I'm looking at you guys and saying, who's going to go into government and make a difference? I mean, there's the elected official side, you know, the whole political side, which is, you know, one whole world. And then there's the administration, where stuff really gets done. So I, look, I spent six years in government last time I was government. I was, when I left government, I got this little job at Skowhegan. First day I got there. After the percent for art? After percent that? for art. I was running percent for art for New York City. The first day I got there, they said, we need some computers. I said, how do you buy computers at this organization? They said, you go downstairs to the Gateway store. You go and you buy it and you bring it back up. An hour later, we had the computer. I couldn't believe it. You know, in government, I mean, how long does it take us? It takes months and months of procurement, and uh, uh, requirements contracts, and this and that. So I don't necessarily recommend you guys all go into government and stay there for your whole life. But I'm telling you, it's the place, it's the scale, right? What's the, what's the budget of New York City? What? 84, 87 billion, yeah. Right? That's scale. Okay, so, but it's not scale for, with frustration. It's not for everyone, as you, you know. And I'm, I'm curious also, you had a lot of art training. You, um, you're someone who really cares about equity issues of social justice. I mean, it's always been in your life, always been important to you. But you've chosen to work those issues through the arts. Can you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's I was an artist. You know, I started out as an artist. I, that was my training. Um, that little thing that you quoted in the back of the book. And so I'm very interested in this whole idea of socially engaged art, art that you know works in a community setting that has co-authored, meaning you know it's not just the artist you know painting and then going out. So I felt like, you know, one of the things about art is that it's a way of communicating that's less uh, stressful in a way, that it opens people's minds. I mean, I, I was talking to Rick Lowe at Project Row Houses, and I actually went to the graduation ceremony for a group of young mothers, all of whom were single mothers, who, who had come into this program, and they were saying they're graduating, and they were going off to college and this and that, which was sort of gotten their lives back on track. And what they said was, I am so honored to have participated in this art project. Not social service project, not, you know, so there was something psychologically about calling it art that was valuable in terms of the social mission of that organization. So I think it, I'm not saying that all, you know, you should like, give up on Department of Homeless Services and just do art, you know. There's stuff that the city needs to do but I think that, you know, art is an amazing mechanism for social change. I was asking you, I mean, I, I know, I was asking you at, at a personal level, and also just to the last part of this question, 
What do you think from your training as an artist, your education as an artist, what do you use of that part of you in your life, in your job, in your work? What, what, what was it about that pedagogy that has helped you? Yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know. That's a tough question, and maybe somebody else could answer it better than me. But I'm asking you. What do you mean someone yeah. else could answer it? Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is yeah. For I mean, you. I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> but, um, the, I mean, I think it, you know, just valuing creativity. Um, that, you know, I, and whatever, I've got some staff members here. I hope they feel that, that I sort of value it. I love artists, but I also love, you know, ideas that are outside the box. I think that the other thing that I really learned from artists like Tanya Bergera and Rick Lowe and Mel Chin is, is that there's so much value in the sort of, quote, non-expert opinion, right? And that's something that, um, that that's their art, is, is the non-expert, which, you know, the Mujeres and Movimiento are experts in their community. They're now working on a project communicating with undocumented folks in, in Corona and other people about immigration and they know how to communicate in a way that outsiders don't. So that was something that was unlocked, I feel, because Tanya Bergera was interested in that kind of communication. Yeah. But, but I think that's a really good point about artists. And something that I have learned enormously is that you don't need to have academic credentials in something to become an expert in something. And I remember Tanya, when she was starting that project, was I, you know, I need to learn all of this legal stuff. I need to learn about immigration law. And you know, she knew she didn't know that, but there was this jumping off the cliff part. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this because I have this idea. And I, I think that you operate a little bit like that. You know, there's a kind of, a, a, you're not risk adverse. I guess that's, that's a good way to put it. And I think a lot of artists live like that. Yeah, sure, yes. And, you know, sort of embrace of failure as well. But, I mean, another artist that I really love is, is Merle Eucalys, and, and she's like one of these sort of masters of communication. Do you guys know Merle Eucalys, artist in residence at Sanitation Department? So she um, is constantly in this position where she's asking people, how do you operate this truck? How do you operate this, uh, whatever, snow removal vehicle? Like, just asking the questions. She's the genius of asking the questions. So just two other things I want to ask, but we'll open it up. Um, there are many things in the cultural plan which are, and I, this is of course coming from my own orientation as a dean of an art school, we turn out hundreds of artists every year working in all these forms, but so do many, many other art schools in, um, in New York, with so many good ones, and then there are art schools all around the country, and there are music schools and theater schools, and, and everyone is coming here or many people are coming here. And there are many things in the plan to help artists to afford this city, but could, can there ever really be enough to make the city workable for well, artists? I mean, so the, look, there is this very real worry about affordability. Actually, I actually think it showed in the election um, this week that people are worried about the city and the direction it's going. And, and so, first of all, we don't, Control. We don't have a housing plan. There's no housing plan in the, you know, in the cultural plan. There are lots of things about affordability, but I also would like to say that all statistics say that artists are still coming into the city at greater numbers than they're leaving. And so anecdotally, people say, ah, my friend moved to California because it's cheaper, but there's two other people you don't know who just moved in. So there's this upward spiral of people still moving to the city, which is actually one of the reasons the city is so expensive is that it's an attractive city and there are jobs here. Like everybody in this room, well, I mean, maybe a lot of people in this room are students who are considering leaving later, but everybody else who lives here has made a decision to live here even though it's expensive. And, you know, I have to say that I, when I moved to New York in 1979, it wasn't expensive, but it was pretty dangerous and there weren't that many jobs, right? So I don't want to glorify that time either. You had, whatever, 2,500 people a year getting murdered in New York City we now have divided that in, in five, uh, like 20% of that, right? We now have it before. It's kind of amazing. We live in a city that's big enough where you celebrate having only 450 murders, right? But we do. It's a much, much lower murder rate. And, you know, not to in any way diminish how terrible that is, but I mean, compared to other cities in America, it's by far the safest big city. 
which is why people are you know, still coming in. So I, I don't know if that answers it. We are working on something called affordable real estate for artists. We're building affordable studios. There's um, artist housing built into the housing plan. There's individual artist grants. There's a lot of ways to try to deal with affordability, but it's a big picture problem. It, it's a big problem, and it's really difficult. And people stay, but as you know, I don't really need to tell you this, but the struggle to stay is enormous. Yeah. Um, and then related to that is, I think, something we all talk about very much in New York, which is the fear of this incredibly heterogeneous city um, certainly Manhattan, this has become true to a great extent, becoming much more homogeneous. And a lot of the vitality is so dependent on small stores. And I was very pleased to see in the cultural plan that you're really thinking about how to help bookstores. Mm -hmm. I just wish that had come 20 years ago because, I mean, you know, these are the things that make great cities, is the, the ability to walk through a city and have multiple kinds of experiences. And we see it very much up here. Um, the rentals are becoming so difficult that you're losing all the small businesses and you're getting these really, um, these national, international, global stores, so everybody has those same chains everywhere and you're losing, we're losing in New York, that vibrancy of uh, the heterogeneity of it. Yeah. So I, mean, I, think I was glad to see that it was being addressed, at, at least in the cultural plan. It is, yeah, to extent. I think the other thing is, you know, you really have to spend more time out of, outside of Manhattan. You know yeah, I grew up in Queens, Brooklyn. You know, like, Tom, I'm not a Manhattan girl. Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Brooklyn in Crown Heights. I, I do spend time, but I see even my neighborhood in Crown Heights. You know, there was nothing cool about Crown Heights when I was growing up. I promise you, Esther's laughing, but, you know, but it was fantastic because there was the Brooklyn Museum. But, um, you know, there were wonderful things, but there was nothing hip. There was nothing cool. And there certainly weren't any small cultural organizations. But that now, it, the, the difference of it is being taken away. And even yeah. in the boroughs, it's beginning no, to happen. So I'm just, Queens, you know it's happening. Queens too, right across the bridge. Like so I'm just, yeah, I'm, this is not your fault, nor is it the, nor is it the cultural uh, commission's uh, ability to solve it. It's just more to talk about it. No, no, and that, no, real. this is, this is actually, you know, as we all know, who were at these hundreds of cultural uh, plan meetings, it came up all the time. And it is a worry. It's a big worry in New York City. I mean, you know, the, the mayor in his, you know, he did the housing plan. We're going to build 200,000 units of affordable housing. It's the biggest housing plan by far in the country. I don't want, I'm not here to defend or not the housing plan because I'm not that guy. But this year it was all about jobs and, you know, raising the fight for 15, getting, there's two ways to make an apartment affordable. Either you make it less expensive or you make more money. And so both of those are important. It's important also, I feel, to think of ourselves not as separated from the rest of middle class or low income New York City. A lot of artists are low income New Yorkers and have to think of coalitions with other low income New Yorkers, right? It's not the artists versus, right? So that crisis you're talking about. That's a really good debt, point. That's a really good the point. The student debt crisis is a crisis for middle class and low income folks. It's also a crisis for artists given our ability to make money. So, that, you know, there was an article in the Daily News recently that talked about all cumulatively of this administration's policies over four years have transferred $21 billion from, let's say, high income to low income New York. I don't know if anybody saw that article. But all of these issues, you know, rent stabilization not going up for two years in a row, that's a big deal for New Yorkers, right? Um, the way that they, you know, freezing rent for seniors, all this kind of stuff, you know, is, shouldn't be seen as separate. That's all I'm saying. Those are all fantastic things, and I know you think about this all the time. I'm just putting it out on the table. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this to you, all of you. But first, Esther, I was going to ask you if you wanted to ask something. Okay, I'm going to give you my mic. I'm going to let Tom, I'm going to free him from the chair, because I can see it's really oppressive yes. to you. And you can walk around. <laughs> First of all, that was an amazing presentation, and I think, Carol, you asked every interesting question as I was thinking of it. So that leaves me with what I think is probably a politically uh, difficult question to respond to, but since it's part of your plan and your vision, I'll ask it, which is 
The big theme of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which I think is critically important for a city of New York um, to engage with, I'm not sure that I understand completely how that gets incorporated in an arts agenda. I know what you wrote in a cultural affairs department agenda. I mean, I read the report and I understand that. I just take for example this idea that we need to diversify boards more. On the one hand, we have cultural institutions that are desperate to raise money. I mean, from my point of view, God bless you, raise money any way you can, and whoever wants to sit on your board, I mean, how, how can that be a reasonable thing to try and impose on a cultural institution? And then, on the other hand, you're telling us we have these diverse neighborhoods and we have this incredibly diverse art scene. So we're like not going to community-based organizations and telling them they need more white people in their, in their you know, dance troupe that comes from Nepal. So there's something to me who deeply cares about these issues in a broader political context where I understand how to do this, where I'm not seeing it as clearly in this domain. So, there's different parts to that question, but I mean, <clears throat> the, what we're focusing on in terms of our diversity, equity, and inclusion is jobs, right? So we're talking about who works at cultural institutions. And it's our firmly held belief that if you have a diverse staff, you will have diverse programming. So I would, I've said this many times, and I'm asking the audience here, has anybody been to a cultural institution that has a very diverse staff that doesn't have diverse program and diverse audiences. Because if you have, please come forward and tell me now. I haven't, I've said this in public, as my staff knows, you know, many, many, many times, and no one's come up with an example. So if you're saying, we're in a city that's 65% people of color, we are the big public funder, we're giving hundreds of millions of dollars to the cultural sector, we want to see that the cultural sector is serving a diverse and rich, you know, representative that, you know, uh, communities. So I think at that, on the staff level, first of all, I do think that there are lots of qualified candidates. One of the things we did at the Queens Museum, you know, we had a, like an outreach person. And that person left, and, and so, so somebody who applied was a community organizer. It's like, what? Community organizer working at a museum? That's kind of crazy. And we actually you know, ended up hiring her, and she did such a job, an incredible job, of connecting because her expertise was that kind of connection. I can assure you it's not hard to find a diverse group of community organizers. There are certain professions that are already very diverse, and those folks should be coming into with their expertise into these arts and cultural organizations, and they'll create a kind of diversity that you haven't seen before. So look, I have said this many times also, the hardest nut to crack is the board question. Um, one of the questions about these boards is if it's a public institution, um, you know, there's a public responsibility. I mean, I, uh, at the Queens, there was an article in the New York Times recently that published the board and staff diversity, right? So you saw the Queens Museum, which I worked at for years, 30% of the board is people of color, in a part of Queens where that's not representative. That was, you know, pretty good compared to a bunch of other cultural institutions. But, you know, it's, it is a tough nut to crack. It's a tough nut to crack because of you know, the distribution of wealth in our nation, right? So it's because of, yeah, structural problems in our country, right? So, but the other question, and there are different ways of looking at boards, and one of the questions is, are you just going to look at money? There was an interesting article in the Times recently that said, there's an institution out in the Midwest who said, we want, for example, to explicitly recruit somebody who's a low-income person for our board. Because, and that wasn't about race or anything, it was just like about because we know a lot of our audience and a lot of our audience that we want to attract is low income. Why can't you have a low income person on the board? And you know, if you're sitting next to you know, a Rockefeller or somebody, I don't think the Rockefeller is gonna expect the low income person to be giving $100,000 a year. Anyway, it's a tough one. We want, we're not telling people how to do it. We wanna spend this year figuring out how to do it. Some organizations have done better than others. It's a mutual learning process, but I honestly believe, look, we did a bunch of um, uh, focus groups, and one of the things that uh, people of color working at cultural organizations see in their organizations and don't like is the whiteness of the boards, right? And that's sort of a depressing thing. 
at, at a lot of cultural institutions. So look, the board one is a tough one. I'm not diminishing that. We're gonna be talking about it all year. Next year, I'll give you the answer. But I do think that the, the, there's a lot of opportunity on the staff level to hire much more diverse staff. So. Thank you for that wonderful presentation and for the plan. Um, I think it's it's fast, it's incredible that that you have all of these um, that we're in seeking diversity. There's an outreach to all of the different communities who who live in New York. One of the things that concerns me to a certain extent is the audience because how how can we make it so that only not only Ecuadorians are going to Ecuadorian yeah, yeah. programs, yeah. Yeah. et cetera. How can we get people to go to one another's programs? Very good question. So I don't know if you so the, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I have like, some experience in that, and I do know that you know there, that people do you know if it's Ecuadorian Day, it's like it's cool where all the Ecuadorians are going to show up, and but. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that we tried at the Queen's Museum was, was for example, these sort of multi-community um, dance programs. Every, every community in Queen's has a dance school. And so you have the Taiwanese one and the, you know, the Indian or whatever, Sri Lankan. Um, to have those on the same day, to mix people together into those situations, to have a class that's, that's um, we did um, these uh, uh, programming classes for computers, like how to write code, and it would be in Spanish, right? A Dreamweaver, whatever, and another class would be in Mandarin. And then the second one, like 2.0, was everybody together, right? So there are ways of kind of mechan mechanically like putting people together in the same room. I think the other thing, if you want to see people in the same room, go to a library in Queens. You will find the diversity, the comfortable diversity um, that people are looking for in cultural institutions is there. But I don't, you know, I don't want to diminish it also. I mean, that there is this sort of territoriality of whatever tribalism that people want to be comfortable in the group. So I think that, you know, having a very diverse staff is a really good starting point for that. And having people sitting there for a couple of years together, uh, understanding different communities and crossing, creating bridges. You know, bridges are much harder to build than walls. But we got to try. Here you go. Take mine. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question. You had talked about how many recommendations had come out of the plan? 94. If you were, my dear, to choose the three top recommendations that you would prioritize and attempt to make, to implement during your tenure, what would they be? So, Pat Cruz, director of Harlem Stage. Um, I mean, so actually we chose eight, uh, which are in the back of the cultural plan to implement right away. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to remember, Nadia will remember them all. Um, but, you know, we did, uh, so the, the diversity, um, equity, inclusion absolutely is one of them. That green initiative I told you about, about, you know, analyzing the individual artist grants. Um, I'm, that's only three and now I'm already forgetting. What's that? Disability access, yeah. So actually we have somebody starting on Monday who's going to be our first disability access uh, coordinator. We actually have a lawyer on our staff who's very much um, insisting on all invitations, for example, you know, that we send out, having, you know, we did a lot of, um, when we did, we rolled out the cultural plan, the woman who introduced the mayor was, is a deaf actress named Melanie Chatu, and she did it in sign, it was, gave a fantastic little talk. Um, but so disability has been very much at the top of the agenda. Go ahead. Cultural cabinet, yes, which I shouldn't announce, but yeah. So we're gonna have a cultural cabinet which is, which was actually one of the recommendations. We have much, you know, as you were saying, we're a tiny agency. And, you know, Department of Education spends much more on art than we do. But guess what? Probation has a fantastic program. Sanitation has been at the forefront of artist residency with Merle Eucalys. So, uh, so getting the organizations, the agencies together, yes? 
Yeah, yeah. So giving more um, attention to the CIGs in low-income communities because there are CIGs. Uh, it's not equitable where who gets the money within it. Language access. <laughs> you should ask Nadia. Right, she's actually the person who did the work. She's answering. Okay, so language access. Um, we, you know, is we translation uh, is a big deal. That's one of the, that's one of the answers to your question. Also, to get people to come to events, sometimes you need to have them in a couple of different languages. And yeah, yeah. Okay. So then, and also investment in. So looking at those maps that I showed before in terms of the. Uh, civic clusters and the concentrated disadvantaged getting more money into those communities. So those are the eight recommendations. We're already, I believe, making good progress on seven of them. There's going to be a city council hearing coming up soon if you want to hear our full report, which is going to be next week. Hello. To open things up a little bit, as the daughter of a New Yorkan who spent most of her formative years outside the New York metropolitan area, I'm wondering how you view this cultural plan as having an impact on the broader arts community in the U.S. since New York is a leader in the cultural community. Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, so we're, we really focus on the, the boroughs. I will say that um, we've heard that other... Um, my deputy commissioner, Eddie Torres, went to, uh, uh, to one of these grant makers symposiums recently, gave a pitch about the cultural plan, and two other cities are already doing their own cultural plan based actually just on that. So I think it, you know, cultural planning is something that people are doing. I'm not sure. It's kind of a trend going on around America. But I think that the focus on diversity that, you know, and that, that headline, which sort of took the spotlight, I've gotten on Facebook and stuff, you know, messages saying, hey, I guess what, we in Austin, Texas are, are now focusing on that because New York is sort of seen as a leader and we're the biggest, you know, the biggest local agency. So, I mean, it is a plan just for New York City, but I think it does have uh, implications outside of the city. So I'm the director of the Arts Administration Program here at Columbia, and I spend a lot of time talking to directors of organizations about what they would like our students to learn in preparation for their careers. I'm wondering what your answer to that question is. That's a tough one. Hey, by the way, are there Arts Administration students here? Oh my goodness, this whole... Okay, so I'll talk to these guys. Um, I don't know, I mean, my... Feeling. So I, I didn't go to an arts administration. I got an MFA and I was going to be an artist. So I mean, my advice to people in school is always the goal is not to have a particular career path that you understand from the beginning. The goal is to have an interesting life, right? I mean, so you might find yourself, I mean, I was going to be an artist and I then became whatever, an administrator, museum director, commissioner of cultural affairs. That was so far from my mind when I was in school. And you know, my wife got a PhD here at Columbia, and she was going to be an art historian, started teaching, and so then she became a curator. She's a curator at the Brooklyn Museum, so she kind of changed. So I think it, you know, the being uh, open to experimentation, what comes along, being you know, uh, flexible, all those things are extremely important. I, I think that the what you learn in school, some of the most valuable things are sort of lots of hard skills. But when you get out into the real world, a lot of the, what is going to end up me being meaningful in terms of your career is the soft skills. Like understanding, and I don't know if you can even teach it in school, but everybody who's sort of my age and you know, all of us understand that you know, communicating well with your colleagues and you know, creating alliances within the organization you work in, all that kind of stuff. I don't, do you, you don't have courses on that, do you? You do. There you go. So take that course. Uh, <laughs> But then experiment with it and, and think about, you know, and then just be flexible in your life and don't try to... Yeah, I think I see too many people who are just like, I'm going to be really disappointed if I don't end up with like an endowed curator position. It's like, no, there's like five of those in New York City and there's eight and a half million people. So, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I guess, what I'd say. Um, after reading your book this summer on socially engaged art, I was really interested in, in your definition about how there's really 
it's it's hard to find a criteria to evaluate socially engaged art yeah. in relation to uh, the history of modernism and uh, politics of refusal. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate more on, because it, it also links very much to how policy is made, how we evaluate um, what, how we put a, a framework around that that production. Yeah, so I mean one of the things that in my book, it's basically a book of interviews. I mean, I have essay at the beginning and the end, and then, so one of the things I do is I ask artists almost in every, um, in every chapter, so, you know, what is success? You know, so, I, and one of the questions is, let's say you do a project about homelessness, and at the end of the day, one of your uh, participants in your um, project is now no longer homeless, but has, is in an apartment. Does that make it a successful project? And there's like such a range, because these are socially engaged projects, but you know, can it be sort of successful socially and unsuccessful artistically, or successful artistically, unsuccessful? So one of the things I actually loved was um, uh, Rick Lowe's answer to that, and Rick Lowe being one of the people who has really, really made a difference in a lot of people's lives, um, was you know, the idea of art for art's sake. He was talking about just sort of the idea of, of communication and participation for its own sake, that there's a certain kind of beauty, psychological beauty and social beauty just in communication. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but something, you know, I think it's extremely difficult to evaluate. We're doing artists in residence at city agencies now, and we're having evaluators come and watch Tanya Bergera. I don't know, you know, so... It's tough, and sometimes, by the way, I, I had another, we did a little session about the book after it was published, and uh, Ernesto Pujol said, sometimes the community fails. I thought that was really interesting, like, that he did a project that was beautifully organized and, and structured, and there was just such resistance or conservatism or, or whatever, racism in a community that it couldn't work. So it wasn't the artist's fault. I thought that was interesting because, you know, coming from an artist who does this stuff all the time and is actually very, very good at it. Um, anyway, so I think that the idea of what's good, I mean, like, what's good art? What, how do you decide that? So actually I did a blog, I don't know if you've seen it, um, which was, I think it's still available. If you just, uh, why call it art is the name of it. And it was, I asked a bunch of people, I asked uh, Pablo Hoguera or Tanya Bergera or, you know, various people, why is it important to call it art? And I think that gets at one of the questions uh, about, it was about aesthetics, the aesthetics of participation. Why call it art the aesthetics of participation? So, but I don't have an answer. I had a question about, uh, I was thinking about Carol's uh, comment about sort of the homogenization of, uh, of the city economically. And, and um, I'm wondering, uh, how, how or whether the, the, the DCA can, can incentivize established cultural institutions that are in Manhattan in neighborhoods that might be perceived as largely gentrified but of course still have some socioeconomic diversity to, um, to really actually become more community centric. I think I, I come from the theater world and I, I worked for uh, many, many years for an organization based in Chelsea that which drew its audience primarily from the Upper West Side and Upper East Side and a privileged group of people and paid very little attention, frankly, to the people who were just down the block. And, and you know, uh, and I'm curious to know how, how the city can incentivize that kind of... Yeah, so I mean, so first of all, I, I bet you if you find organizations that are very diverse on their staffs that they're going to be... So one of the things, you know the High Line is, you know, whatever, one of the most successful projects ever. You know, it's like crazily, there's actually too many people there. But one of the things that I love about it is they're not satisfied with their audience. And that they really do care that folks from public housing right there next to the Highland aren't coming enough. And I think part of that, by the way, came from Gonzalo Casals, who was their programming guy for a while, from El Museo del Barrio before that, which points a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to put all the burden just on one Latino guy who happens to be working there. Um, but. I do think that um, I, I believe, and we'll see if it turns out to be true, that if you have very diverse staffs, they're going to be caring about diverse, um, diverse communities as their audience. So that's, what we're, that's the theory. Um, let's see if it works. I don't think it could be. 
Is that it? Or nobody's there? Hey, so let me um, ask you a question. Sure. Since nobody else is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is actually we were talking about. We didn't actually end up Both talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're kind of old hippies, right? And not. Speak for yourself. Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, uh, I was never really a hippie. Oh, you weren't. Okay. No, I. So, but I was. Not this, really. So it's this thing is like I'm a commissioner and you're a dean. Right. We have this question, right? So I mean, I think I maybe talked a little bit about why I wanted to be in government and make a difference in how. So what about why are you a dean? And you, we, I knew you as a dean at Chicago before that. So let me just ask that, and you have the last word. It's awfully sweet when your guest speaker gives you the last word. It's very kind, actually. Um, well, it's not dissimilar to what you said. I really can't. Um, I can't really, really can't bear when things don't work well. And that's a real liability because you end up trying to fix things a lot. And I guess another uh, strength, and I attribute this, I talked about growing up in Crown Heights, but I'm half Jewish, half Catholic, grew up in a very uh, orthodox neighborhood, <laughs> but not really Jewish. And I think when you grow up and you're not one thing, you get very good at talking between groups of people, you ha your own hybridity becomes very useful uh, to you. And I had a friend, Monsignor Jack Egan in Chicago, who was second to the Cardinal in Chicago. And when I got to know him, because I brought the poet Ernesto Cardinal from Nicaragua to Chicago, I got to know all these very radical Catholic people. And he said to me when he met me, are you Catholic? And I said, well, I'm Catholic, but I'm also Jewish, and I do both, and actually I'm a Buddhist. And he said, this is your great strength. And I had always thought this was a complexity. I never really saw it as a great strength. But I realized when I came into work with artists in the art world that the ability to listen to people's individual discourses and to explain to other to people what another person was saying actually came out of coming from multiple cultures and knowing that there was no purity in the world. And uh, so that liability or that strength, however one wants to think about it, uh, manifested in Chicago. Jana was with me in Chicago where I was faculty teaching literature and philosophy. I never intended to run anything, nor did I want to. I just wanted to be a writer, always. But I found myself constantly explaining my colleagues to each other, and before I knew it, I was running the liberal arts program, then I was running the graduate school, then I was associate dean, then I was dean, then I was acting president. You know, this is what happens to you if you have this kind of aptitude. And, and then struggled for a long time whether that aptitude was something I wanted to pursue. But I always say to people, when they complain about the university, the way people might complain about government, if you really want to make change in the university, you need to be in a position of authority. You can't make change sitting off and whining over here. You can do your job and you can teach classes, but if you want to see real change happen, you have to get in a position where you can actually activate change and people will listen to you. So that's my answer, really. So I wanted, so wanting to, and wanting to be subversive within traditional structures, which you may, maybe that was the hippie part of your comment, that we're both basically subversive people trying to fit into traditional institutions. Is that right? Which is hard, okay. yeah. So and then I'll just, sorry, I will take a look. No, no, let's okay. go ahead. So I'm, no, no, it's a, uh, so I'm also half Jewish, so my father's Jewish and my oh, mother we never, Christian. we never talked about that. We never this. talked about that. Maybe that's why we're friends. But my, my <laughs> wife, hold on, my wife's mother was Muslim, father Confucian, right? So we have four religions, two intermarriages. So your son. My son has four religions. It's Muslim, Jewish, Confucian, and Christian. And that, by the way, I'm a big fan of intermarriage. Me too. Right? It's a good idea. Think about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's thank Tom.